In the first triad of 1159, a final plan was accepted for the vessel that would follow the path indicated by the Guidestone. What had delayed the project for so long was simply that no one, neither astronomers nor religious leaders, could say for certain what had brought us to Karak, and so none could say what an expedition would encounter. It was finally decided to build a vessel that was capable of doing everything, including establishing a new colony deep coreward. Known simply as the mothership, this vessel could be part carrier, part survey ship, part factory complex, and most importantly of all, the temporary home for millions of our people frozen in cryogenic sleep. It would have to be able to deal with the great unknown reaches of the galaxy and whatever discoveries or threats they might contain. It would be the greatest construction project in our history. Ministers from every clan abandoned their cloistered competitive policies and pooled every resource to develop stratagems and designs and then allocated them to the various industrial hubs throughout the polar zones. In the meantime, clans that had been trailing the cutting edge in technology and production turned their efforts completely over to agricultural work, feeding those who were occupied by the construction effort. The planned mothership was so massive that it took 20 years simply to build up the infrastructure required for the construction project. Asteroids from the debris belt were pulled into a parking orbit around Karak. Here, manned cutter ships used high-energy lasers to break these planetoids into manageable sections that could be towed into the great maw of the phased disassembler array. The PDA used a series of fusion torches to reduce the planetoid chunks into their component elements. Robotic materials plants then combined these elements into whatever alloys and composites were required for the grand task at hand. Many of the lessons learned here were refined and implemented into the next generation of resource gathering ships that would serve the mothership herself. The next step was to construct the orbiting scaffold where the mothership would be built. This framework took 10 years to complete and is the single largest structure ever built. New disciplines in macro-engineering had to be created and put into practice just to complete this construction yard. The scaffold runs 25.6 kilometers long and is stationed in middle orbit around Karak. Easily visible from the surface, it is the only moon that Karak has ever known and has been a natural fixture in the night sky for almost four generations now. Only the eldest of our people can remember a time where the skies were dark and there was no glittering lattice work to remind our people of their destiny. Over the past 25 years, the mothership slowly took form inside the scaffold, building up in layers from the center sections outward until the final layer of ceramic armor was laid down just last year. For the last eight decades, there have been over 10,000 technicians, along with another 25,000 robots working on this ship continuously. Many of the fusion torches and materials plants that broke down and were processing the planetoids early in the construction program were cannibalized and incorporated into the mothership itself. During the course of this massive project, 2,357 personnel have given their lives for the future of our people, and their names have been engraved on the central hyperdrive core aboard the mothership. They will never be forgotten, and their brave spirits will precede this vessel into the gulf of hyperspace. The mothership is designed to be a mobile construction yard on par with the original orbital facilities which created the mega vessel in the first place. The automated manufacturing bay is capable of high-speed production of vessels, 
from tiny scouts to larger ships that are yet to be designed. Various parallel production bays allow for dozens of larger components to be cast and assembled at the same time, thus radically reducing the time needed to build larger vessels. Ship components are based on modular technologies, many of the same ones being used across various hull designs, thus saving time and allowing for a faster, simultaneous construction. The foundry floor is capable of using multiple construction tracks to simultaneously build a fleet of scouts, assemble a squadron of corvettes, and create enough ordnance for both sets of new ships. A large hangar provides docking sleeves for a huge array of vessels to be serviced, or the same sleeves can simply be used as berths should the mothership need to enter hyperspace with a large fleet of auxiliary ships. None of this would be possible without the immense quantity of raw materials brought in by the resource collectors. Built around the model of the original cutting ships, which were used to break down raw materials for the initial construction of the scaffold and the mothership. The resource collectors are designed to reduce and acquire a variety of space material ranging from solid planetoids to gas nebula. The collectors then return to the mothership and transfer the contents of their holds for processing through a phase disassembler array. While this PDA is smaller and quite a bit more efficient than the orbital one used to supply the scaffold, it works on the identical principle of arrayed fusion torches. It will reduce any material to its component elements, while a magnetohydrodynamic shunt field sorts the vaporized elements according to atomic weight and carries them to the storage cells. The massive honeycomb of storage cells almost 3 cubic kilometers of storage space lies just under the surface of 75% of the mothership's hull. This allows for quick access and venting in the event of a jam or storage cell rupture as well as providing a final layer of armor. The mothership has two modes of travel. The first is based on conventional fusion drive technology and is basically a series of large fusion reactors designed to vent high energy plasma through an opening in a shaped magnetic bottle. Maneuvering jets are fed plasma from the main exhaust through a series of conduits and this allows a portion of the main thrust to be diverted to maneuvering. The mothership's secondary drive is less well understood but it is the system that makes this journey possible. Toward the lower aft portion of the ship lies the large shielded area containing the hyperspace module. This is direct copy of the one found under the sands of Kartoba, but expanded 12-fold to accommodate a vessel of the mothership's mass. Even though the effect has been tested extensively through ships fitted with test module of various sizes, our control and understanding of the effect is somewhat limited. This has resulted in a need for massive energy to induce the wave front, prohibiting its use on any vessel too small to carry at least three industrial fusion plants. There is another drawback to our limited understanding of hyperspace. We can only induce a linear tunnel effect of massive proportions with a relative recruit control of distance. The module is projected to have a range of 2,500 light-years for a single waveform event and in order to trigger the drive, we must charge the module with all the energy required for such a stunning distance. Should we wish to travel a more appropriate and cautious distance, we must crudely halt the wave effect by discharging the module's energy and dropping back into normal space-time. Currently, the hyperspace module is programmed for three priority interrupts. The achieved target interrupt is based on our own astronavigation technology, which takes a sighting in normal space and will discharge the module once the time versus distance hyperspace algorithms state that we are roughly near our programmed coordinates. 
the anomaly interrupts occurs when a gravimetric anomaly is detected by ship sensors and the vessel is automatically returned to normal space to either gather resources or, in the case that the disturbance is actually another vessel, investigate further. Finally, the safety interrupt occurs when ship's control computers sense any irregularities in either the waveform effect or the mothership's hull integrity. All three of these interrupts empower the navigation computer to automatically drop the ship into normal space. As the project near completion and the full size and complexity of the mothership became clear, system coherency specialists encountered a problem that seemed to defy solution. In even the most basic function simulations, there was so much data to be analyzed, so many responses per second required, that the projected bridge crew grew into the hundreds. As new command staff were added to the simulation, the hierarchy became completely unmanageable. It became apparent that in any sort of crisis, the mothership would quickly suffer from communication paralysis. Computational experts tried, but no simulated intellect system they could devise could be trusted 100%, and the whole project was at the verge of collapse when the young neuronics expert stepped forward with a desperate plan. Carranza Jet was working on experimental biological circuits that would mimic brain functions. When she heard that an information bottleneck was facing the systems of the mothership, she quickly realized her research could be put to another purpose. Neuronicist Sajet suggested using an existing brain, her own, to bridge the gap between living nerve branches and the mothership's data shunts. As Fleet Command, she is capable of handling hundreds of alerts and updates per second while analyzing what tasks can be handled automatically and which situations need to be brought to the attention of the crew. Should the ship come under fire, she will instantly analyze systems across the ship and monitor all response activities. Fleet Command observes the status of all vessels and updates their positions. Research reports are also processed through a central core, along with information on construction projects. It is the job of fleet intelligence to analyze incoming data from probes, observation equipment and sensors. Centered just below the main bridge is a large spherical chamber containing work comm stations with data shunts centered around a full holographic projection pit. When the mothership is underway, this pit will be manned permanently by shift teams composed of the best scientists, diplomats, linguists and tactical officers, all specially selected not only for their knowledge but for their adaptability. Fleet Intelligence has access to not only the Mothership's sensors array, but to the Fleet Archives as well. Whatever the Mothership should encounter in deep space, Fleet Intelligence will interpret the data and give as accurate an analysis as the situation permits, offering tentative conclusions and tactical recommendations. The major stumbling block for the plans to start a new colony was life support. The resources needed to keep 600,000 people alive for years in deep space are simply impossible to store and transport. The mothership would have to be so huge that no number of fusion plants could move it. To solve the problems of a long space flight, our life scientists turned to cryogenic suspension. With their technology tested and perfected, Engineers began filling the cryonic holds with the 600,000 pods that would be required for the journey. Volunteers have chosen to surrender as much as 12 years of their lives before the voyage even starts in order to be processed for cold sleep. First, they are prepared and placed in their cryonic pods where they are slow frozen over a period of two weeks. The pods are then stored in holding areas deep under the surface of Karak, 
until 100 of them are ready to be placed on the rack module and boosted into space together aboard the heavy lifter units. These rack modules are then loaded into large cryo trays. A single tray provides power and stable containment for a thousand rack modules, 100,000 individuals in all. The six cargo trays will be loaded in to the mothership once their hyperspace drives have been successfully tested. Until then, they will wait in a stable orbit near the scaffold. The vast hull aboard the mothership containing our people is in the most protected and armored area of the vessel. The cryonic vault stretches for three kilometers and is almost a kilometer across. All that is required for life support is a constant supply of power to the freezing units. A deviation of even a single degree can be fatal to the occupants if it occurs outside the intricate revification procedure. In light of this, even though the 600,000 pods draw their power from the main reactor core, some auxiliary fusion pylons are set into the vault walls, each one capable of handling the power demands of the vault by itself. Boarding and cryogenic placement has been occurring on schedule for the past decade. <laughs>